This is The Close-Up. Conversations about creativity. From our studios in Los Angeles, here is Jim Chabin. Roy Taylor is here. He's from AMD and serves as Vice President of Alliances for AMD's VR team, where his mission is to drive VR content creation here in Hollywood and elsewhere. VR is probably one of the most talked about new technologies of my lifetime. Does it live up to the hype? Is it as big as everybody thinks it might be? I think it's going to be bigger than anybody can imagine. The important thing to remember, however, is that we are right at the very, very beginning. You know, I think, if uh, my memory serves me correctly, the first movie ever made was um, by the Lumiere brothers in France in 1895. We're at that kind of similar position. It's the very, very beginning. You know, VR isn't going to be a big thing, it's going to be everything. It's going to affect every single aspect of our lives and the way that we interact with the world and the way we view the world. So I think, yes, it's going to be really, really big. You've watched a great many technologies uh, move through Hollywood. This one requires the technology uh, uh, experts from Silicon Valley to be actually working with the creatives uh, in, in the storytelling area. What needs to happen for us to make great, great VR? Well, I'm really happy to come along and to talk to you today because the more people we can get our message out to, the more people we can help. You know, AMD recently uh, opened an office here in Hollywood. We're at 6600 Sunset. Uh, we're staffing out as quickly as we can so that we can engage um, with studios um, and help them uh, by giving them software, technical advice, uh, engineering support, and hardware so we can show them that you can make really, really good, fine quality, wonderful VR that's going to surprise and delight consumers. Talk about VRX and talk about VR on the lot and what you're trying to accomplish there. It's very interesting, you know, um, uh, doing what I do, I have a foot in the gaming world and also a foot in the, in the Hollywood entertainment world. And one of the things that has surprised a lot of people from Silicon Valley has been how wholeheartedly Hollywood has embraced VR. Um, the way that it's embraced it is to make VR experiences um, to promote traditional format films. Um, and for a while, these, these experiences didn't really have a name. Now, I'm talking about things like The Martian, like the interstellar VR experience, Jurassic World, The Walk, an Emmy Award winning experience for Sleepy Hollow. But these things, are, they weren't, I mean, they're not games. Um, they're not movie trailers. Uh, they're not movies. So what are they? So we came up with the suggestion that we call these VRX, or VR Entertainment Experiences. We've tracked around 30 of these that have been made so far. We estimate something in excess of $50 million has been spent making them. And we believe they're an art form in their own right, and they should be recognized as such. They're a brand new medium um, that surprises and delights uh, people. So we really want to encourage the use of the term VRX. We're being supported by that, uh, by CAA, uh, WME, and uh, United Talents uh, Agency. And we're also being supported by that, by the previs industry, which is making most of these, uh, these experiences so far. You've seen, uh, you've seen probably more VR than anyone. Is there a sweet spot? When we think of a movie trailer, we think, okay, it's going to be about four minutes. When we think of a full-length feature movie, we think about 100 minutes. When you look at what we're doing in VR, do you have a sense of what the length of an experience, what that sweet spot is, what people will put the headset on and experience? What do you think about uh, length of these? Well, that's a, that's a really good question. Right now, most experiences are short. Uh, and the reason for that is because people don't know what they uh, they don't know what people are going to like or want, and the people trying it out don't know if they're going to want to stay in it for very long. Um, but this is the interesting thing: as VR is getting better, so it's getting longer, and we're starting to see that people are comfortable to stay in VR for a while. The Martian, which we've been talking about, for example, is 30 minutes long, um, and it goes past so quickly you don't even notice it. So I think the, the answer to your question is, if you make really good VR, people will want to stay in it. Phil McNally at uh, Condition One said, remember when movies came out 100 years ago, they were very short. Yes. Right? They were very short movies. They were three or four or five minutes. Yeah. Uh, only, only later did we learn that we could keep an audience engaged for an hour and a half. It's important for all of the people who work in this industry to find out how to make pr a profitable industry out of this. What's going to be critical uh, to building this so that people are uh, excited and ready to pay uh, uh, $19.95 or $9.95 to have an experience that they can bring in and enjoy over and over? What's core to that mission? 
Yeah, it's a very good question. If you look at the VRX which is being made today, it's almost entirely funded out of marketing budgets. And there's nothing wrong with that, except that the production values are capped by the amount of money the marketing department will give you. Um, I believe that to get the kind of content that's going to somebody's going to comfortably want to pay twenty dollars for, we're going to have to give them production values that are in the region of seven hundred thousand dollars to a million dollars a minute. Um, but that can't happen without those revenues. So we're kind of in a cash twenty-two. And that's why I think that location-based VR in movie lobbies, where you can go along and purchase a connected narrative to the movie you're going to see, is very important. So let's say, for example, you're going to go and see Transformers Five. But when you go to buy your ticket at Fandango, for a small extra fee, you can go and watch the eight-minute backstory or side story. That will introduce a revenue model that I think is essential for, for Hollywood and for our industry to really take off. I saw Ang Lee uh, uh, recently at the NAB, and he was discussing virtual reality. And what he said was, uh, I'm a storyteller. I think virtual reality people have to teach me something, so mm. I understand them. I think I have something to teach virtual reality people about storytelling that will help them. So uh, you're on the, uh, the board, the VR Society has launched this initiative. It's gonna be on the Paramount Studio lot. And the goal here is really to bring great directors like Robert Stromberg and the team from Jungle Book and other creatives together with VR people to see if we can create a community and a, a body of work that is worthy of all the excitement on these uh, on these uh, devices that we're discussing. Um, how important is that process? We need to put together experienced hands, people that have made content, they know how to make movies, and we need to get them together with a technologist that can help show them how VR can progress. But also, very importantly, we need to get the youngsters in. We need to get the, the, the guys from the film schools. You know, I was recently at Chapman University uh, at their film school, and some of the talent, some of the ideas the young filmmakers have got is incredible. So, uh, you know, your idea to bring all those people together at the Paramount lot in October, I think, is, is really, really a great one. And we're going to do everything we can at AMD to help make the event a wonderful success. We're going to show the audience some uh, slides here, uh, Roy. This is a survey done by Steve Seidman uh, in New York a couple of weeks ago. A thousand U.S. Uh, adults were asked uh, about VR. Uh, we asked people about their excitement, about the experience of VR in the future. Across the board, the excitement by consumers for VR is, is really, really high. Look at 45 to 60 year olds, 62 percent. Uh, women, 65 percent. Most importantly, you expect the gamers to be 78 percent because VR gaming is going to be hot. But of the people who've tried uh, VR, 88 percent are excited. So if they tried VR, they're even more excited. Yes. And I, I, that, again, that's, that's no surprise. Uh, you, trying to explain VR to someone that's not tried it is, is really, really difficult. But when you do try it, that's when you become converted. You know, m initially I was a little skeptical about VR. Um, you know, this is the third time around that it's, it's been introduced. Uh, but when I went to Oculus for the first time and met with Brendan Ereb, the CEO, and tried it, I was just blown away. I was like, I want to, I want to spend my career. So doing Oculus this. is the headset that is supported by Facebook, mm -hmm. uh, and. There's been a, a great deal of discussion, but it doesn't take much of a leap of your imagination to think that the day will come when you and I, who are Facebook friends, will be able to get together, right? Yes. Uh, uh, in the same space uh, via VR. And if you're in a, a pub in London and I'm in Los Angeles having dinner, we can actually uh, meet up via our headsets on, uh, on Facebook. Yeah, and we'll both be 25. That's it. I like that a lot. Uh, VR benefits that excite. This is the next slide. Explore places on Earth I can't travel to. 74% of the people who were asked that question think that's a great idea. 87% of the people who've experienced VR uh, think traveling to a place I can't normally travel to would be something VR would be fantastic at. Explore other worlds. Uh, I feel like I have superpower capability. This is clearly for gamers, right? Um, 75% among gamers thought that was going to be a very cool uh, asset. Um, and then experience entertainment more deeply. 80, 86% of the people who uh, have tried VR think still ex experience entertainment more, more greatly. Uh, what does VR do um, that, that gets these kinds of uh, these numbers? Well, look, you know, if you think about it, all entertainment, all of it, to until now has been a rectangle. 
well, maybe necessarily think of it that way, but, it, but it's, a, it's the truth. Whether you're looking at a silver screen or you're looking at a, at a screen on your smartphone or on your television or your computer, you're effectively looking at a rectangle. Uh, um, and you're looking through that as though you're looking through a window. Until now, we've been on the other side of the window. With VR, we step through the window and we are on the other side. So we're there in the content. That's going to create some challenges. Uh, movie directors, for example, aren't going to be able to control where the camera lens is facing, but it'll also create some wonderful opportunities. We'll be able to be in the scene, quite literally. And I think um, that is very, very exciting, to step through the window and be on the other side. Oh, my goodness. Likelihood to experience VR at a movie theater. Would you take five to ten minutes at a movie theater lobby to experience VR? 69% said that they would, which means that the public is even willing to go to a movie theater and experience something uh, in the lobby. How do you imagine going to a movie theater, your favorite movie theater, going there a little early, you get your Coke, you get your popcorn, you're waiting around to go into the theater, and there's a VR experience. Talk about what the potential is there for movie studios and others. I think there's huge potential. You know, right now, um, v good quality VR is expensive for most people. I mean, you, need a, you do need a powerful computer. The headsets are, you know, $600. And I think for a lot of people, that's a lot of money. Secondly, for a lot of people, setting VR up isn't that easy. You know, there are cables involved. Um, you do need some kind of basic knowledge of how computers work to, to uh, install it. And so for a lot of people, I think that's a little off-putting. So location-based VR, where you can go and try VR for the first time or, or on multiple occasions, where you don't have to do anything. Everything is ready for you. In a place or location where you're used to experiencing entertainment, I think it's going to be a very, very big thing. I, I really, really do. So I want to go see the next Star Wars movie, and in the lobby, I may be able to get a chance to ride in a Starfighter. Yes, before I absolutely. go to the movie, that's absolutely. pretty cool. Yes, and maybe my premium ticket to see it on the IMAX or in, in 3D in the movie theater includes the chance to experience it in the lobby. That's pretty exciting stuff. Yes, and, and you can't get it anywhere else. No, and in an industry that wants people to keep coming back to movie theaters, that's uh, that's pretty important. I think it's. Uh, I think it'll start out in the lobbies. Um, but I think it will evolve. You know, the, uh, the VR experiences will become richer, deeper, and longer. And therefore, at some point, it will evolve and actually be in the theater itself. So for all of this to happen, Roy, uh, for the VR experiences and all of the power that's going to be required to drive this, uh, you've really created a product at AMD called uh, uh, Liquid VR. Tell us about the product and what does it do? And I think you've brought something here today to, yes. to, to talk to us about. Yes, I have. You know, um, it wasn't so very long ago that it was almost impossible to talk about VR without a follow-up comment about uh, motion sickness, uh, about you know, making, making you feel kind of uh, unwell. And that was a huge problem for the industry, really, really big. Uh, and the reason that sometimes happened was because of something called latency. You know, you move your head like this, but the image doesn't move as smoothly. And, it, and when it, the time it takes to catch up, that's what, we, that's what we describe as latency. So I put on the set, and I'm in a room, and I turn my head to look to my left or right, and the picture isn't quite staying up with my eyes. Right, exactly. So, so my, head, my, my head tells me there's something wrong. Right. right. So that was a problem. So we looked at that problem, and we invented something called Liquid VR, which uh, is a software for content creators to use, uh, and also for, uh, to use with the content consumption. Um, which uh, didn't completely eliminate it. It's not completely gone, but it's gone so much that today we don't talk about it. So we're very proud of what we did in inventing Liquid VR. It's been downloaded um, from a website called GitHub uh, with what's called source code, so anybody can edit it, um, thousands and thousands of times, and is now very, very widely used, including by HTC and Oculus. So we were really, really pleased um, to have invented that and helped solve one of the problems around VR. But the software is not the only part. You know, we're also known for making powerful CPUs and GPUs, and those are needed both to create the content and also to play it back. Uh, on the creation side, uh, recently the NAB show, we launched this product here. Uh, this is uh, what's, it's a graphics card, for anybody who's not seen one before, plugs into the computer. And this card allows you to either take 360 VR camera content and stitch that together extremely well, because it has 32 gigabytes of RAM. It's an enormous amount of RAM. Uh, a usual gaming graphics card will have four gigabytes. So it gives you uh, some wow. idea of how big wow. that is. And so this is the perfect tool for content creators. 
Um, and then on the uh, content consumption side for, for gamers and people that buy the HTC and Oculus headsets, we also have a range of products called VR Ready Premium, um, which users can, and can, can install in their computer or buy it pre-installed from HP, Dell, or Lenovo. And, uh, and that will give them a beautiful, smooth playback experience for experience in VR. What's the one thing that concerns you about um, uh, what we need to pay attention to to make sure that this is a very, very successful industry over the next few years? Yeah, the, um, the, the concern is we don't yet have a piece of content, which is so great that we call in sick from work just so we can, we can uh, experience it. That is so great that we get up early so we can go back into it before we have to go to work. That kind of content will come, but we don't have it yet. The sooner we have it, the better, I think, for everybody. Um, part of that is, a, is because of the installed base of, uh, of headsets. You know, we need HTC and Oculus and, and everyone else to ship not you know, hundreds of thousands but, or millions, but tens of millions so that it's accessible. We need those location-based uh, VR experiences to get installed as soon as possible so that that will then create the kind of revenues and, and, and uh, continued investment so that content can come to, can come to fruition. Is this the most exciting technology you've seen? Oh, goodness, yes. You know, I, I was fortunate to be at the very, very beginning of 3D. Um, in, uh, back in the late 90s, in uh, 1996, started working on 3D. Uh, I was uh, the founder of NVIDIA in Europe back in those days. And I remember the excitement about what 3D could do to gaming. It was great. If I compare those days then to these now, this is an order of magnitude bigger. You know, we're really fortunate, you know, you and I, Jim, that we're working in this medium, which is going to just change everything. So, uh, yeah, this is, this is the greatest time in my entire career, greatest time of my life. Well, you're the most articulate advocate for VR. <laughs> uh, you are a champion in this technology. You're knowledgeable on it. You're leading the way. So please come back soon and keep us up to date on what's happening. And thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you, Jim. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. The Close-Up is produced by the Advanced Imaging and VR Societies in Hollywood and is powered by Barco.